Um, I'm here with my friend Ethan. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm in the mysterious disagreeer one. You can yeah. also call me Ethan. Yes, um, he's just he, uh, a friend at my university. We discuss religion a lot, and so um, today we're going to be um, having a little discussion on the Eucharist. And to start, I will say what my position is. I believe that uh, the Eucharist is the true presence of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, and that um, in the Bible, uh, he is speaking literally when uh, speaking about you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. You'd like to say your position? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I don't hold it quite to that literal level of what Jesus says. I take it more as, you know, it's a symbol of remembrance, as Jesus explicitly says. And when you take the Eucharist or have communion, it's not the literal body and blood of Christ. Yeah, and so we'll, we'll be having a, um, a discussion here, friendly discussion, talking about uh, what it is that we believe in hopes that uh, maybe you'll be able to gain some, some greater perspective on these things and see where each one of us is coming from. Uh, we, will go, we will be going point by point through Bible verses and um, the history that, uh, that supports or goes against um, either one of our perspectives. And to start, I'd like to uh, first bring up just the very beginning of everything, um, Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, where Jesus says, uh, he, then he took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in memory of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. And so I'd like to begin by saying that um, I do believe that this is um, a very literal interpretation. Do you have something to say about that? The first reason I would say is he gives them bread and, I guess, wine. So my first impression, if I was just reading this, no context is he's saying it as a representation, right? He's giving them physical bread, he's giving them physical wine, and he's saying this is my body, but he's doing it as a metaphor, right? This bread represents my body, this wine represents my blood. So that would be my initial impression of having no context reading it initially. Yeah, and I do think that that is an understandable perspective. Uh, when, when talking about literature, people say this is, but in, but in reality, it is, is a metaphor for um, this it represents. However, I, I, I will point out, uh, he says this is, and so you can interpret it to be metaphorical. However, it is not an affirmative as in saying, this is a metaphor of my, my body, and this is a metaphor of my blood. It is, it is left ambiguous at this point. Um, as to whether he's being literal or he's being metaphorical. So because of that, we have to look further into other verses in order to determine uh, whether or not he is being metaphorical or um, literal. And to, for, to that point, I'd like to now bring up John 6, 53. So I'll give some context for this to begin. Jesus was speaking to um, some of his, some of his would-be disciples and they were discussing amongst themselves the, the manna in the desert. And to this, to, to this, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh for the, for the life of the world. And they queried among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so I'd like to point out here that um, they do seem to be taking it literally. And you can see this a couple chapters back when Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus tells Jesus in response to, Jesus tells him that he needs to be baptized and, or and reborn of spirit. And Nicodemus says that, how can you, re how can you be reborn? Um, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, go back into your mother's womb. And Jesus clarifies at this point. He tells Nicodemus, no, you need to be reborn of spirit and water. And so this is a similar situation where you see the Jews, they say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Clearly here, they are taking it literally. They're like, you know, this is ridiculous. How can a man ever say such a thing? And, through, to, and, and in response to that, he says, amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I have, I have life because of the Father. So also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. And so one thing I'd like to note about this is when Jesus says for you to eat him several times, and it, and it seems to get progressively more, um, more and more gruesome. Because when you look at the English translation of it, Jesus just says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And then whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. But in reality, um, when Jesus says this again, what he's saying in Greek translates more closely to saying gnaw. So to gnaw in my flesh. So he says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. But then he gets progressively more gruesome with it. And I believe that that is to emphasize this point and to make it more and more clear of the literal nature. Because you have to note that he's responding to them thinking that he's speaking literally. And one would imagine that he would respond by clarifying that it's not literal. But what he does is he just goes further to make it more literal. You must gnaw on my flesh. And in response um, to this... Is, oh, yes. I want to quickly uh, know which verses are you referencing? I can actually check that right now just to make sure. Make sure I'm telling you the right one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the note is for John 6, 54 through 58. Eats, the verb used in these verses, is not the classical Greek verb used of human eating, but that of animal eating, munch, gnaw. It, it notes in here in my Bible, it's a, it's a Catholic Bible, it says, um, this may be part of John's infinite, an emphasis on the reality of the flesh and blood of Jesus. But the same verb eventually become, became the ordinary verb in Greek meaning eat. So uh, through translation, it sort of lost some of its emphasis. And that is the point that I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. And uh, briefly, I'll, I'll finish my, my, um, my, my thought on this. And then you can spe start speaking. So Jesus is being very literal here. He's, being, he's speaking very literally. Um, you could argue that maybe he, ha he has a metaphorical um, meaning, but the connotation of what he's saying, going from eating to gnawing and continuing to repeat what he says, saying you do not have life within you if you do not eat the, fl uh, the, the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. And so in response to this, then many of the disciples who were listening said, this saying is hard, who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that disciples were remembering about this, he said to them, Does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. Now, in this verse, um, when he says, What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? What is happening here is he's saying, Oh, does that sound crazy to you? Well, imagine seeing the Son of Man ascending to heaven. So the Jews, they thought that this was crazy. Because um, the claims of him making of him being God were just ridiculous to them. They couldn't conceive such a thing. And so he thinks, if this shocks you, then, you know, wait to see when, when I resurrect. And um, he says, uh, the spirit that gives life while well, the flesh is of no avail. Now, Ethan, will, you'll probably have some comments on this. But, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you talk on it and then and then I'll, I'll give my counterpoint. But, um but uh, yeah, so because of that, a lot of them left. They left. And usually in the Bible, um, when Jesus says something that is that is people misunderstand, aside from perhaps his parables, which are meant to be confusing, um, he either clarifies or the or the the author clarifies. And so he doesn't clarify anything here, and they leave him because of that. And um, he looks to his the, the his apostles, the one who would eventually die on his behalf, and, and asks them if they'll leave too. And uh, they, they say, you know, where else will we come? And with that, I'd like to let you speak on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot there just in this whole chapter. Uh, Javier obviously went through a lot of, you know, there's a lot of points you could make here for why it's the literal body and blood. But uh, I'm going to go back to just start with your eating point. So the clear shift between... The eating to the gnawing you were talking about starts in John 6, 52. Mm -hmm. So the word here is used, uh, I believe it is estio, E-S-T-H-I-O, or the Greek, the Amer or Latinized whatever version of the Greek word. Now, that's a quote from the Jews. And then when Jesus speaks, he's talking about eating. So that's in 53, 54. The word he uses instead is 
Progo. Not showing. Oh, okay, Progo. Uh, T R O G O. Now, when we look into reference onto where it's used, each of these words, if we go look at SDO, it's used very much, it's used apparently 63 times, and it's used very much in the traditional sense of eat. So exactly what you're saying, Javier, uh, the other word that Jesus uses is it kind of became eat. But the word STO that the Jews initially use means to eat. It's like reference Matthew 9, for example, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Mm -hmm. Or may we go to another writer, other than Matthew, uh, we go to Mark. Uh, Mark 6, 37, but he answered, you give them something to eat. Uh, are, we go, are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? So it's very much that traditional word eat that we think of in English. Now that's what the Jews say. And then when we switch over to what Jesus says, he uses a different word, and that word is trogo. So it's also translated in English into eat, but if we look at all the places it's referenced in Greek, which is it's used six times in Greek, it's almost always referenced to the communion or the Eucharist. So it's used in John 654, 656, 57, 58, and and later on in John 13, 18. So it's actually really only uh, John that writes with it, that word, but I think the most important thing to note here is that the Jews use one word for eat, but Jesus uses a different word for eat, which the implication there is that the eat that the Jews are thinking of is different from the one that Jesus is thinking of. Mm -hmm. So you're exactly right. The Jews think of it with the literal interpretation of we're going to eat his flesh and blood, but Jesus says, no, you're going to eat, but this is a different type of eat. So I don't think Jesus is referencing a literal type of eating like the Jews are thinking because he uses a different word for eat. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that that point would stand if if the, um, the word that he used interprets as something which has a metaphorical connotation. But I don't think that word just because only he uses it in reference to the Eucharist means that it is a different form of eat. When you look at how it translates in Greek, it, it translates to munch or gnaw. It's, it's, it's sort of um, more akin to animal eating. That is what the, the, the word would have meant at the time. That's what it would have been referring to. And so I don't think that's necessarily just something else entirely. They thought that he meant as in, you know, eat you, like actually eat you. And he says, yeah, you're going to eat me. You're going to gnaw on me like an animal. That's um, essentially what the connotation of that word is. So if you wanted to... What would be his implication? Why just use eat? You yeah. Just want him to eat. Yeah, and so I think that the implication here is that he was. They were already shocked that he was saying that um, that they were gonna that they they were gonna have to eat him. And so what he did was is he 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 took it even further, saying, "You're essentially gonna gonna gnaw on me, you know, as an animal would." Um, so is to make it more shocking. And so what I think that he's doing there is that he is, is furthering his point. He, he is putting more emphasis on the, the, the fact that, that they're going to have to eat him um, to make it more literal, to make it more guttural, uh, to add shock to it. Because he's sort of subverting what you would think he would do, which is clarify that you're not going to actually have to eat him, and he does the opposite. He makes it more literal. He's saying, you're going to have to gnaw on me. Um, and so what I, I think uh, what you would expect here is like whenever he clarifies in Nicodemus about baptism or when um, the, uh, he tells the apostles that Lazarus has fallen asleep, they think that he's literally sleeping, but what really happened is that Lazarus died and Jesus says, no, he, he died. You would think that he would do something like that, you know, just clarify in this instance if he didn't mean it in a literal sense, but he does the opposite. He furthers it. He makes it more gruesome. I don't think the point is that it's gruesome. He's very clearly creating a contrast. So if you look at John 6, 58, Jesus uses both. So he says, your ancestors ate, and that is the word estio. That's the word that the Jews use and means literally eating. Right? So he's saying the ancestors ate, literally ate manna, which they did, they ate the literal bread. But then he says, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever, referencing his own. And the word feeds is like you're saying, nah, or gnaw or like animal eating 
that word speed in the Greek is the one that Jesus uses. That's the trogo. So it's very clearly creating a contrast between the ancestors who literally ate the bread and feeding on his bread, which is a different type, right? Otherwise, it would just be the same type of eating. He's not just saying, oh, you're going to gruesomely feed on this bread. No, there's a very clear contrast between the old type of eating and the new type of eating. It's a different word, different type. Yeah, and and you, that, I think that's uh, when I, when I say um, a gruesome type of eating, what that's doing there is he he's just he's saying that word in order to put emphasis on the fact that you're gonna have to eat this to sustain you, that it, that it's it's going to be um, very important to you because he says whoever does not eat the the flesh of the son of man um, and drink drink his blood does not have any life within them. So he's just making more apparent that this is what you're going to have to do. And because the word has like an, an animal connotation, he, he, he's just sort of subverting their expectation that he would clarify that it's metaphorical. I don't see how um, using that word would be sort of any indication of a metaphorical um, connotation just because it's different than the eat that they're using. I think it's quite the opposite because it, it, it's referring to naw. But why is that word naw when it's used in the Bible almost exclusively used in reference to taking the Eucharist or communion? Right? Why isn't it used in other places when it's talking about animals eating or right, the normal type of naw? Because I think there's a clear contrast. Eight is the physical eight, but Jesus is trying to say this word feed, naw, uh, trogo means eating. Jesus' words, his. Yeah, I, I think that's getting, just getting salvation. Yeah, and and I think that it's just it's just used, and that's in that um particular instance with in re reference to the Eucharist, just because what he's just trying to make a contrast to to make it as you said to make it apparent that this is, you know, that he's being serious that you need to, you need to eat him, because the connotation of the word at the time would have meant gnaw. Yeah, the, it doesn't. That doesn't necessarily have to be used in the Bible in reference to animals eating to to for that word to mean that because that's just what it meant at the time, and so him using that word is is just emphasizing the point that you're gonna have to eat him, as opposed to making it uh, more metaphorical and lofty. He's he's being very um, guttural with it. I don't think he's being guttural because I think this word very explicitly means something different. So the word trogo is only used six times in the Bible, in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And of those six times, five of them are in reference to communion or the Lord's Supper or, or the Eucharist. And so I think it's a very clear distinction between this eat is set apart for taking communion versus the normal eat is set for eating normal meals. Yeah, and... and... And uh, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll move on from this. I'll, I'll just say I, I, do, I think we, we both believe that um, it's, a, it's a separate connotation, but I believe what you're saying is that um, because it's different than the normal form, the normal word for eating, then that would mean that um, it has a, like a specific connotation just for, the, for, just for, um, for communion, that it would, um, it's, it's a metaphorical or... Um, it, ha it just has its own connotation because it, that's just in reference to what it would I mean, you know, just that action. And I, I think that I would agree. It just that word, the connotation of it being gnawing um, adds to it being literal as opposed to setting it apart to say that um, this is like this metaphorical form of eating is different from literal eating. Um, but I, I think we'll we'll go ahead and, and move forward um, to one Corinthians. Uh, I'll just make a quick final statement. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, of course. We'll just each make our final statements. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> I think clearly the Jews say estio, the normal word for eating, but Jesus very clearly replies to them with a different word, and that's his contrast in saying, no, not your type of eating. This is a different type. And this type of eating is not really used anywhere else in the Bible, other than in reference to communion or the Eucharist, which is implying there's a, there's a different type of eating. It's not the physical, but most likely the spiritual. And then 
And later on, Jesus also creates the contrast, saying the ancestors ate SDO, the literal eating. But this, whoever feeds on this bread, my bread, as in Trogo, that's the real type. It's different. So your ancestors literally ate, but they're going to feed on this bread spiritually. That's different. Yeah. So that's how I am seeing it. And I'm, that's why I'm saying that the Eucharist is a spiritual, not literal. Okay. And <laughs> Next so point. I think from here, we'll move on to uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. I think that's one that you showed me. You were the one who introduced uh, me to this yeah. one. Um, and 27? Yes, 27. Yeah, so then I read the bread or cup or drinks the cup. So yeah. I was referencing this. Uh, are you good to go? Yeah. Okay, I was referenced, just referencing this in that Paul explicitly uses different words. He uses the bread, eats the bread or drinks the cup. Mm -hmm. So he used the word bread and cup, not the body and blood, which is usually associated in Luke 22 initially with the Lord's Supper that Jesus presents. Mm -hmm. So that would imply that here literally it's still bread and it's still just a drink, not the body and blood of Christ as when Jesus presented it initially. Yeah. And yeah, but it says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. And, 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 and you know, you look at this in the context of um, what, what Paul is talking about here. It's the tradition of the institution. For I received from the Lord what I also have handed unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was handed over took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it, said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in rem remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat th this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread unworthily, or whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily, will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. So it, it, it is referencing to, to the institution of the Eucharist. And my, my point here would be that if it is just a metaphor, then why is it that those people who, who eat it unworthily uh, will have to, to answer for the body and blood of the Lord? He's clearly making a connection here between this bread and, and, the, and the cup to, it, it, is, it is substantiated. It is like, it is, the importance of it is the body and the blood of the Lord. And um, uh, he says, for anyone who, who eats, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks the judgment on himself. So what he's saying here, for whoever eats and drinks without discerning the body, discerning this is the body of Christ, they, he eats and drinks judgment on himself. And he says, that is why many among you are ill and infirm and a considerable number of dying. If we discern ourselves, we would not be under judgment. But since we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. And so I think that it, it really doesn't make any sense that a metaphor would be so important because the argument for the metaphor is that when you're saying, at least the, the way that I understand it, is whenever he says, eat this, eat this bread and drink this cup, the metaphor would be like, oh, um, receive and respect his sacrifice and uh, what it, you know, what it is that Jesus went through and, and use it as your salvation. But Paul here is literally referring to the actual communion, the tradition, which is established and saying that you, you drink judgment of the body and the blood of Christ whenever you receive it unworthily and that a lot of people are dying because they're not, um, they're not receiving it correctly. And so my argument here would just be that if it's a metaphor, then why would it carry such a, the actual act of eating and drinking it would, would carry such an important connotation that if you eat it unworthily, you die. Oh, well, it does not say you die. It says some people have died. Well, yeah, some people have died. Directly it says you'll be guilty of sinning. Mm-hmm. So I think there's the connection of sin here, where if you do something unworthily, you'll be sinning, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's a lot of other things that can cause you to sin. So for example, you can sin in your thoughts, you can sin in your actions. So very much so in your actions, 
taking it in an unworthy manner will be a sin. That makes perfect sense. And because you're doing this in remembrance, right? It's in memory. So say if you go to a funeral and you just do everything in an unworthy manner, you're like cracking jokes at a funeral. That's, you'd, you'd probably be, say, okay, that person was guilty of the equivalent of sinning against the person that died. Mm -hmm. it, it's very much similar, right? It doesn't have to be that it's the literal representation of Christ's body. No, you're doing something in remembrance of some. If you do that unworthily, that is disrespectful. And I think from that perspective, you know, you can really make either argument here, honestly. It would be more, this, I feel like this is more a perspective of, it could go either way. But because you're sinning by doing things in an unworthy manner, it is you're remembering someone. So mm -hmm. that can either mean they, it is little representation or it's not. Yeah. It could go either way. And I would just, just comment that it, um, it, it doesn't, in, in, the, in the exact verbiage of it, it, it doesn't really give any sort of connotation of a general, um, you know, the importance of it is uh, its remembrance. It, what it says is that whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord and worthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. It is drawing a, a direct connection between um, the bread and the cup to the body and blood of the Lord, saying that it, it amounts to that importance. Um, at the very least, you would have to acknowledge that uh, the act of communion isn't isn't like a, a metaphorical light or it isn't a, it isn't a light matter it's 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 gravely um, it's gravely important and its implications are grave which i think at the very least goes against a lot of um protestant and and you're you're non-denominational so this wouldn't necessarily apply to, apply to apply to you but there's a lot of protestant traditions in which they um communion is just something that they do here and there you know, and, and they, they just, they, they take it lightly. I think at the very least, this, this establishes that it's a, it's a grave matter. What do you mean by they take it lightly? I, I'm just, because I'm not aware. What, uh, I, I, so and, and I, I don't know too like... much about it, but, but I, I've spoken to people who just say that they don't think it's really something that's, that's important, or it's, you know, it, it's just a, uh, you know, a little, nice little metaphor. I think at the very least, this here establishes that a person, it says a person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup for anyone who drinks the bread and, and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. It is, it establishes it as being a grave matter. So, so I've been to mass and I've seen it. So tell me how Catholic mass does communion differently than just, oh, they kind of just eat it and think about Jesus. Because I think from an outsider's point of view, it very much look like that. Yeah, and so I, you describe how it's different. I'm glad that you asked that question. So, um, in the Catholic tradition, we do believe that it's the real presence of, of Jesus. And so, um, first of all, if you're not acknowledging that fact, then you should not be receiving communion. That is the what the Catholic Church teaches. You you have to acknowledge that this is what this is. And if you are in a state of mortal sin, then you are not. Um, fit to receive communion. You have to be in a state of grace. The Lord, that is that your sins have been repented, you've gone to reconciliation, and that you know that this is the body and, and the blood of Christ. And only then are you in a worthy state to receive it. So, um, it, and, and, and to receive it without having repented your sins or um, knowing that it is the body and blood of Christ would, would be a mortal sin for us. So in that sense, it is given okay, so a you're great importance. The extra thought that goes in that, that Protestant churches don't put in. Yes. That, okay. Um, do you have any other comments on this? Any, any final remarks? Um, the main thing I would just say still is why would Paul explicitly use you know, you're going to kind of notice I'm very picky about the words. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but I, I would say Paul cho chooses the words bread and the cup very explicitly rather than just repeating body and blood. And he basically explicitly does not reference, you know, in communion that it is the body and blood other than when he quotes what Jesus says. So mm -hmm. those aren't his words. Those are Jesus' words. Yes. But he says the body and blood. You'll be guilty against saying the body and the blood, but... I don't know if that's necessarily in communion. Um, I know we disagree on that, of course, which is just like, <laughs> but 
but he just uses bread in the cup more than he does with body and the blood, which that kind of seems to push it the other way of yeah. what he's thinking, seeing it as. Yeah, and in my answer course, to that, mm -hmm. sorry, my my answer to that would just be that he's colloqu he's just used colloqu you know colloquially using the term red and cup, um, just to, just to reference to what it is. I mean, Jesus himself says, "Eat this bread, drink this cup. It is my body." So Jesus already established connection that the bread is his body, and, and you know Paul Paul is just going off of that using that same verbiage that Jesus used. Um, he, he, he's not being super nitpicky to always refer to the Eucharist as the body of, of Christ, though the connotation is still there. He's, he's just colloquially referring to it as bread is what, is what I would say that, that, that's just, that's just what he's calling it. But reality, we know what it really is, as he says, um, amounts to answering for the body and blood of, of the Lord. Those and good final statements. Yep, and uh, I think from there we'll move on to 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17. Well, I, I guess go back, we're moving back a little bit. Paul here says, Therefore, my beloved, avoid idolatry. I'm speaking, to, I'm speaking as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I'm saying. The cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break is it not a participation in the body of Christ. Because the loaf of the bread is one, we, though many, are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. From there, he goes on to, to speak about idolatry. He says, look at Israel according to the flesh. Are not those who eat the sacrifices uh, participant, pr participants in the altar? So what am I saying? That meat sacrificed to idols is anything or that... An idol is anything. No, I mean that when they sacrifice, they sacrifice the demons, not to God. And I do not want you to become participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and also the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and of the table of demons. So when, when he's talking about idolatry here, he's saying that you cannot participate in the cup of the Lord and also in the cup of demons. And um, in, in trying to promote, promote that point to his audience, to the Corinthians, he says, the cup of the blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? I think that um, quite literally here, he's saying you are participating in the body of Christ. You are participating in the blood of Christ. It's pretty clear verbiage that he, that he's saying that, that this bread is the body of Christ. That is what you're participating in. So that'd be my argument here, that just a literal interpretation. And so it, uh, what would you say to that? I would say if you take this verse in a vacuum, I think you're exactly right. You could take it as the bread. We're literally in the body of Christ, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair interpretation. But I think we also have to take into account the next verse, uh, 1017, because there is one loaf. We, who are many, are one body, where we all share the same loaf. Mm -hmm. So once you take that in context, when we're talking about bread, and he's also saying we are, we are part of that one body. We all share that loaf. It's very difficult to say, because 1017, I mean, taken, I don't, would you say that's taken literal, that we are part of one loaf, literally? Like, if you get a yeah. loaf of bread, that represents all of us? Yeah, so the one loaf is Jesus Christ. So you can have people with different churches mm -hmm. in different places. Paul is writing to these people. He's obviously not with them, otherwise he would just be talking mm -hmm. to them. He, when he says we, yeah. he's referring, he was referring to the whole body of Christ, all of the Christians. He says, the, because the loaf of the bread is one, Jesus is one, we, though many, are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. If you were to think about this in the sense of we're all participating in the one piece of bread, that wouldn't make sense because here he's clearly referring to all the Christians. So it doesn't make, you know, it's not like all the Christians come together to a convention and eat of one piece of bread. Uh, he says the one, the one loaf is because the one loaf, because the bread is one, we though many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Everyone, all the Christians everywhere, doing the doing the communion everywhere, are participating in one loaf. That is Jesus Christ. And because uh, though we are many, we're all doing this in different places. Um, we are part participating in, in in the one loaf of Jesus Christ, and because of that, we are one. 
So I don't think that you can look at it in the sense of we're all participating in the one piece of bread because that wouldn't account for the fact that you have all sorts of Christians doing this everywhere and he's still saying that they're all one because they're participating in one loaf. Which, you know, mm-hmm. they're not literally so, participating in one loaf. Yeah, when we say we're all united as Christians, we're all in the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. I think universally that's accepted at a spiritual level. We're all spiritually connected with Christ, right? Can you can you say that again? Uh, so when we say we're united in one body, in the body of Christ, that almost always means on the spiritual level. Like we're all spiritually connected through Christ, right? Yes, I would say so. Mm-hmm. So based on that, so we who are... So, Paul is saying there's one loaf. We who are many are one body. So he's basically equivalenting that we are just one loaf of bread. Does he mean that in a literal sense that we're all going to be a little bro- literal loaf of bread? No. He's saying that we are one body, which is like Christ, connected through him spiritually. And this piece of bread, the individual piece of bread from that loaf is also part of us. Yeah, so I think there's a difference between when we say the body of Christ is in the, the hall of the church and mm-hmm. what he's saying here, because he's not he's not referencing here just the body of Christ as in all of the people. He's saying because the loaf of bread Except is one, he is. He, he's, he's connecting it directly to the loaf. And so? Except I think he is referencing all of us. We, who are many... Because the loaf of bread is one, we though many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. You're saying that um, he's referring to we as in the body of Christ, or the, the, the whole of the church, all of the Christians, and I would say yes. Mm-hmm. But he's connecting this to, the, to the, the loaf, the specific loaf that we participate in, saying that because we participate in the one loaf, we are many. Or no, we are we are one, though we are many. And the one loaf is Christ, right? And the one loaf is Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and and he's referencing this um, to the specific act of receiving communion. So he's saying directly through that specific act, we are unified as one. And because of that, him saying the one loaf can't be referring to to a, a loaf of bread, because you you have different loaves loaves of loaves of bread at different places. No, so what it becomes is the body sense. of Christ. No, it's not spiritual sense because the, the 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 bread that we have the bread is is substantiated. It's turned. Um, what we say is that it's transubstantiation. So in species, it still appears <clears throat> to be bread before you appear as taste and looks like bread. But in substance, it is the body of Christ. And you have, you know, different loaves in different places, but they all um, together become, in substance, the body of Christ. And we are participating in that one substance. That's a point I want to get into later, probably towards the end, but let's stay here for now. Yeah. Uh, Are you good for me to respond? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, as I'm reading, (laughs) it's... There's one loaf, but that one loaf, when when Paul's writing about one loaf, he means it, right, to continue the idea of from communion. And then he's using it as a spiritual representation that we're one loaf, if we're connected, but that really represents how we're connected with Christ. So then he's, that would heavily then imply that the bread we break is a participation in the body of Christ, also spiritually. So, again, there's a missing there's a different interpretation of the words and reading that we are going through. (laughs) Yeah. Once again. Yeah. And, um, I would, I would just say that it doesn't necessarily mean it spiritually. Like it's literally because he's saying that when we do this action, we are, we are, we are united as one. He's saying like through this literal action, we are, we are literally united by participating in the one body of Christ. It's, it's, uh, it's not really, I, I don't think that when you, when you, when he's saying 
uh, when we participate in the one loaf, we are we are um, spiritually connected. All is one because he's referring to to the to the literal literal action. It's it's not because the loaf is one. Though we are many, we become one. It that that one loaf is trans the loaves in different places are all trans so transubstantiated into the one body of Christ. And just for the viewers that don't know, could you give like a brief definition of transubstantiation? Yeah, and transubstantiation is the idea that that uh, when we get the Eucharist, whenever it is um, in Mass, it is it starts off as bread, but it is transubstantiated into the body of Christ when the blessing happens, and that what that means is that it uh, in species it looks and appears to be bread. But in substance, it is the body of Christ. Yeah, sorry. Uh, keep, keep going. You probably want to restart with transubstantiation. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so transubstantiation is just the idea that when the bread is blessed, it becomes in substance the body of Christ, though in species it still appears to be the, the bread. And so it, it literally becomes the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, I made my final statement already, I would say, so yeah, and, can go and, to the next point. And so, yeah, I think after that, uh, uh, probably the last thing that we'll, we'll, we'll mention here in, in this little discussion is what it was that people were saying in the early, very early years of Christianity. So I'd like to speak about Ignatius of Antioch. He is a Catholic saint who, who died in the year 110 A.D., so uh, he died, and on the way to Rome, where he would be executed, I think he was, yeah, he was eaten by lions um, for being a Christian. Wow. Yeah, on the, on the way there, he, and he, he told, like, he, he told the church, don't rescue me, let me die. He wanted to die for, for, for Jesus. And uh, on the way there, he wrote several letters, and this is in 110 AD. And uh, before that, he was the, I believe he was the Bishop of Antioch. So he's writing these letters on, on his way to die in 110 AD. And he says, Take note of those who hold he heterodox opinions on the grace of Jesus Christ, which has come to us, and see how contrary their opinions are to the mind of God. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Lord, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, flesh which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his goodness raised up. Those they who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. So it's very clear here that he's being literal. He, he, he clarifies it. He says, they abstain from the Eucharist in prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he says, flesh which suffered. And, and, and in saying that, he's saying, he's literally saying that this is, like, the Eucharist is the flesh of Christ, flesh which suffered. So he, he's being very clear here that, um, not metaphorical like this, he's actually talking about the flesh. And he says this in his letters to the Sumerians, 6-2 through 7-1. And uh, I want to point out how early this was, because 110 AD, the last apostle probably died in like the 90s, not John. Ignatius of Antioch, along with Polycarp, they were they were connected to the apostles through 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 the lineage of their teaching. Like these guys, they, they got their stuff from, from the apostles, the guys who would go on to... Uh, to 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 speak the word the word of God in the Bible, and so I, I really don't think that there is any way to reconcile his literal interpretation, um, with with a metaphorical understanding given the context of how early this was written, and um, his connection to the apostles. And another good one would be Saint Justin Martyr, um, in his uh, first apology, uh, sixty six, he says. And this food is called Among Us. Oh yeah, and uh, the, he wrote this, and it was written between 153 and 155 A.D. It's a little later, but it, it's still pretty early. It's still within the second century, not that long after um, Jesus, not not that long after Jesus died. He said, "For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, um, but in like manner as Jesus Christ, our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God." had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise, have we been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word and from which our blood and flesh 
by transmutation are nourished is the flesh and blood of, of that Jesus who was made flesh. He, he's he's clarifying here that it is truly truly is the flesh. From these, it seems to be pretty clear that um, not that long after the apostles, guys who, who learned their stuff directly from them, um, are clarifying the, the truth of, of the Eucharist. And uh, I, I don't think that it became common opinion that the Eucharist was metaphorical until, I believe, the, the, the 1500s uh, during the Protestant Reformation. So I don't think that this is something that can be really reconciled. So do you have to say about that? So, yeah, I definitely say this is the strongest point for saying that Eucharist is literal flesh. And honestly, I don't have anything for it because it's history. It's what people wrote it's difficult to just say, no, that's wrong. So I don't have anything for that, but we want to move on. I was going to touch back on the idea of transubstantiation. I'm probably the biggest thing that would probably be maybe the biggest hurdle for why people would have trouble taking the Eucharist as the literal representation. And that'd just be logic. So does it make sense to say, okay, this bread we probably bought in a grocery store. And this grape juice we probably also bought in a grocery store turns into the literal flesh of Jesus and his blood. So I'll just pose that question, see what you have to say. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think to answer that, I, I would probably just, you know, go back to what, what Jesus was saying. I, I really do think that uh, the idea that the bread and the wine somehow becomes the, the flesh of Jesus Christ, it's a, it's a hard saying. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's a hard saying. Um, and I think that I would just respond to the way that Jesus did whenever the, the Jews, uh, were, were quarreling about the same issue. They said, the saying is hard, who can accept it? And Jesus said, does this shock you? What if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before? It sounds crazy that the, the bread and the wine could somehow become his flesh, but I think it's even... I think that that is a uh, something which is definitely not as crazy as Jesus rising from the dead, and uh, and being God. I I think you know when you look at the context of everything, it seems crazy, but um, truly anything is possible with God. Such as when Jesus had, I believe, seven pieces of f pieces of food, and he handed it out to he had his disciples handed out to to hundreds of people. Um, oh, awesome. he, yeah. he clearly is able to, to perform miracles and, um, manifest something from nothing. Um, these are things which he's done before. And though it is a hard saying, especially in this day and age and in a place like America, it is a difficult thing to accept, but I, but I do think that is not beyond reason in, in a uh, theological context. Yeah. I think that makes perfect sense because Jesus very much so did work with miracles. So when he gives the initial, uh, in Luke 22, 19, you're saying the initial uh, blanking uh, communion, mm -hmm. he does say it's the body and the blood. But as we we're talking about earlier with 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul says it, he uses bread in the cup. So it's, what if it's a possibility that Jesus, he can work the miracles and turn the bread and the cup into his literal body and blood? but other people who aren't divine like him cannot, like Paul can, mm -hmm. right? So he just uses bread and cup. Yeah, and, and to that, I would just say that um, anytime in all of the, the, I believe in all the iterations where, where Jesus says this, he says, do this in remembrance of me. He isn't saying, mm -hmm. he isn't referring it to being as separate actions. He, it is one action. What he's doing is what we will do in, memory, in remembrance of him. And uh, I, I think that uh, there is a clear implication that the, the apostles who would go on to create uh, successors of themselves had powers. They had the power, they had the Holy Spirit, they had the, um, that was imbued on them so that they could speak the word of God. Um, and they, they had uh, the powers that to, to, to bind and loosen, you know, the keys to heaven and the power to forgive sins. Now, I do hold the orthodox opinion that that uh, public revelation, that is, uh, the word of God speaking through them ended with the apostles, but the apostles were appointing new apostles. 
uh, when Judas left the group, uh, they, they found a successor for him and continued to make successors. Yeah, as you can see, you have people like um, Ignatius of Antioch going on through the, the as you know, the bishop, you have the bishops of different areas. Uh, there was a formal structure that continued, passing on the, um, the offices of the apostles, and I believe it is through them and uh, the, the, the powers imbued to them by Christ that they are able to continue to um, perform the, uh, the miracle of transubstantiation, which Jesus initially performed and then said, do this in remembrance of me. So you still believe that people today can still do miracles? So even after apostles, people are still doing miracles and changing the bread and the cup into his body and blood. Yes. So what would that, what is the process that does that? So how can a priest do that? Right now, I can't give you the, the you know, the, the, all the words that he says, the full blessing, but it, the mass itself is, is, is a, um, it's a celebration that's the main part of it is the Eucharist, the representing of Christ's sacrifice, and it is through um, the blessing that he says um, from the consecrated hands of a, of a priest who has devoted his life to uh, performing the sacraments that uh, he's able to, to, to do that. And in Mass, you see, go through the process of him blessing the, the, the bread and blessing, blessing the, the cup. And... Um, it is it is it's through that blessing that he's able to do that just as what Jesus did. He said a blessing and then broke the bread and and um and presented the cup and it was his body and his blood. It's just it's the same thing. Uh, the final point I wanted to bring was uh, okay, it's kinda on the same lines as the priest thing. Like how does the priest turn the bread and the cup into the literal body and blood, but how do you, do you, so the priest does it, but what if they don't? <laughs> now that's, how do I describe it? What if God does not give them the ability to perform the miracle? Right? What if, let's say they are not, I mean, obviously there's been scandals in the past with the Catholic priests, but oh, yeah. what if they are not in the right place? Then what happens to that bread in the cup? Guess since it hasn't been transformed in that case. So I I think um I I think just by by um and and, and I'm not too entirely sure about this. I've never mm -hmm. I've never encountered that question before. But off the top of my head, I would just say by 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 virtue of them being having been ordained, like it, it's a long process that you have to go through. That's like like going to college and getting a master's degree is what you need to go through to become a priest. And um and I think whether or not you're in a you're in a state of mortal sin, what they, they still do um, in, in both the traditional Latin Mass and in, in the, the Novus, Novus Ordo New Mass, the one that you would be familiar with. Um, the, the, the priest has a tradition of, of, of saying that he's unworthy and, and asking God to just give him the, 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 the power to be able to do this in Novus Ordo. He gets water, holy water, and, and washes his hands, saying, Wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sins. So there's a tradition that they do before before doing the Eucharist. And um, mm -hmm. I would also, something also that I'd like to note is that um, there have been several cases of Eucharistic miracles which have happened over the ages, one of which occurred, and they preserved that Eucharist, um, the, the bread and the, the bread and the, and the, and the, the cup, they preserved it after it had been like transubstantiated into actual like actual tissue and actual blood and it was tested and i believe the 80s and it was shown that it was um it was heart tissue that had been that had shown signs of trauma as it had been it had been beaten and um it was type ab blood and these th these are things which, which have occurred on several instances throughout the throughout the history of the church I believe in this instance, the priest was doubting that it was the true presence as he was consecrating it, and it became it truly like in an, an, an appearance. It became uh, heart tissue and blood, and and I think that's just mm -hmm. an additional thing which would sort of, I mean, you, you take it as you will, um, a thing which has occurred and there was testing which occurred to, to show it. Do you have the case where 
uh, the trans it was transubstantiated. Like you well, know, transubstantiation is is the thing that always no, happens. No, no, but like yeah, in, in this case, it, it, it actually race. gained the appearance. Yeah. Um, like if I was to look it up, what would it be? Yeah. So. Um, this specific instance I'm talking about is Lanciano, Italy. It's from Lanciano, Italy. It was in the eighth century. Um, and this this article here eighth says, century. yes, it was from the eighth century, and they they preserved it. Um, they actually still have it, and there's pictures of it. It uh, the priest had doubts about the real presence in the Eucharist, and after and during mass at the consecration, the bread and wine visibly turned into flesh and blood, and they preserved it because the Catholic Church tends to do that. They preserve they preserve relics of that sort. And the in 1971 through 1970-71, and again in 81, an investigation was led by scientist uh, Odorado Noli, a professor of anatomy and patho pathological histology his, his, his and chemistry and clinical microscopy. Micros micros Sorry, I, I cannot say words. And he was assisted by Professor Ruggiero uh, Bertelli of the University of Siena. Final question. Yeah. So how does a priest have the power to bring Jesus' literal presence from heaven down basically onto earth? Because it's not the Holy Spirit, but Jesus. Yeah. Um, or is that even the correct interpretation, I suppose? Yeah, I, I, I would just say it, it's through just through apostolic succession, the powers that he gains through um, the power which was handed down through the apostles. And you see this a lot in the Acts of the Apostles. Where Jesus gives them the power to forgive sins, and um, and, and the power to, to bind and loosen the keys to heaven, and um, all these things, which they they are given the power to do, and what it amounts to is that they're acting in the place of Christ. Christ would go around forgiving people's sins, um, and and doing the like, and he and he, he now hands that on to the apostles. That is the the clear the clear implication that is given. Throughout, I believe most of the Acts of the Apostles, he's giving them the implication that um, his office, uh, his mission, is being continued on through these apostles. And as you see them appoint new apostles, it is clear that they are now handing it on to new people. And through that apostolic discussion, you go down the go down through the all the ages, and um, every priest theoretically can be traced back to a um, traced back to the apostles. Now in practice. It's a little hard to do that because um, documentation is, is scarce in some places. I think that for most priests, you can trace it back like 500 years, I believe. But um, but the, the, it becomes muddly after that. Uh, it, 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 it goes back and, and like in reality, it goes back to the apostles. And so it, it is an office and a power which has been passed on throughout the ages. And that's what that is. Mm -hmm. But how are... So how are these priests able to call down Jesus? Because doesn't that just heavily imply that the priests are almost above Jesus, right? Because we're very clearly told we're below Jesus. Yeah. So how is it that we're able to call his presence down to earth? Well, um, to that, I would just say that it isn't by their own power that they do that, but the power entrusted to them by Jesus himself, because it's what he did. He, he took the bread and said, this is my body, is what he did. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And just as he told the, 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 the apostles that they could forgive sin, as he did, it is not through their own power that they do it, by, but by his power, which he entrusted to them to continue his mission throughout the ages. So you're saying he entrusted power to the apostles and they've passed that on. Mm -hmm. So why can't the average priest do miracles? They do. They uh they consecrate the Eucharist, they forgive you for your sins, and they um, I mean all the like baptism, cool. the things which they do, it th those still are miracles, and um you see instances of it where, where um, in species it it does occur, in, such as in Lanciano, Italy, and there are special cases where they they do heal people of of, an, of bodily infirmity, it's just something which is which is not as as common. Um, just something that, that I, I suppose that, uh, uh, the Lord doesn't find it to be a necessary thing for them to, to go and, and, and make people walk all the time, such as the apostles did when they were first establishing mm -hmm. Christianity. Sorry, it was just, I laughed just because you said something that was like, Protestants always say, it's like, 
oh, the priests have the power to forgive your sins. Well, yeah, power entrusted <laughs> to them by by Christ. It is not by their by their their own virtue that they do it, but by what Christ entrusted them to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not seeing because of the priests. Like, okay, they can do this one miracle supposedly of turning it into a literal body and blood, but they can't. They're just like your average human. They can't do anything else really, right? Like, if we go to the SMU, the Catholic priests. I mean. I think they're just normal people as well. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I feel like that's a, that's an argument which you could also use against Christianity as a whole if you really wanted to. Um, the argument that um, all, all of these miracles were happening in the Bible, so why is it those things aren't happening today? I mm -hmm. think that that you you'd have to observe how that can be used against Christianity as a whole. If you're looking at this from a, from a from a like a Protestant perspective, looking at Catholics, you could use that same argument to say, you know, why if if this was true, then why aren't these all these miracles that are happening in the Bible happening today? And so that I would just answer that it's just not God's will that these things happen. I think that that was just something that was an an apostle special of them going around telling people to walk and they start walking. That was just something that was happening in that day and age, just so that people would would, would recognize um, the power that these that these guys had at the time, and begin the spread of, of Christianity because they were being persecuted, and I and, and I would also say that there are also instances of, of miracles of them healing people and doing all these things which do crop up from time to time in history. Um, you, you find like truly incredible things such as the Tilma of Guadalupe, uh, where Mary appeared. In Mexico, and um, left behind a tilma from from the man that she appeared to, where uh, you see her image on it, and we still have that. It's in Mexico. It's in Mexico City, and scientists have examined it. There is no ink on it. There is no any sort of any sort of uh, you know anything that can make that image. And the tilma, the uh, the fibers that it's made out of were supposed to have decayed after around ten years. It's been like five hundred. It, it truly is a miracle, something which can be on which cannot be explained. We still have that. It's in Mexico City, still around, and because of that, that's I believe the main reason why um that area was was converted to Catholicism and still remains that way. These miracles still happen, and you still have instances of of, of priests performing these these kinds of miracles. I think that is just not God's will that it be so be so um per, like um prevalent. As it was with the twelve apostles. Okay. <clears throat> Some may disagree, but leave that for a different discussion, I suppose. Yeah. And so I, I think that's that's probably everything, um, everything we we have here. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you very much for for joining me on this discussion. Mm -hmm. yep, thank you for inviting me. It's a great discussion. And you guys have only seen this video, but it was a very much longer discussion that yeah. took place over like two months. So <laughs> this yeah. is like the summary you're getting, and it's already like probably over an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. But um, uh, just if you have any questions, any comments, any disagreements, any comments on what I've said, on what he says, please just leave a comment in the comment section. I'll, I'll try to get back to you, talk about this, or any suggestions on any any discussions which can happen in the future just let me know and i'll try to put some resources for some of the things which you said in the um in the description thank you thank you